let's talk about close combat in the age of firearms. Hello, I'm Jonathan, also known as the PC Genie, and in request, well, by the request of actually two of my viewers, I am going to be talking about, as per the title, looking at what contexts and scenarios would be realistic, or perhaps in a fantasial situation, it would be reasonable to use close combat, such as using swords or just grappling and all that kind of stuff, but when you've got people around using guns. So, now let's get to my first point. Now, I can't remember exactly the, the distance that in the United States they had this sort of, it's not a written down rule, but sort of this unofficial rule that they tend to have cycling around of the police forces around the top. It was something like 15 or 20 feet rule where if someone with, let's say, a knife or some other close combat weapon wanted to run in and do some harm to that police officer for whatever reason, uh, then the idea was if they were within that distance then they were considered to be sort of too close. I will just call it the too close rule, because I can't remember if it was 15 or 20 feet. But within that too close space, the idea was that by the time they'd be able to charge in and start attacking and harming that person, would be they wouldn't have enough time to react to draw out their firearm and start shooting. And that's interesting because, I mean, I, I certainly agree that there are certain times for reactions and certain abilities for people to use projectiles, such as, I mean, even if you look back in history, things like bows and crossbows, you know, it's not like, I mean, people seem to have this imagination, this fantasy idea that, <clears throat> you know, basically all of swords and things just, just disappeared as soon as you had guns, and you can tell in this sort of arrogant way that people go, you know, if you're talking about knights and armour and such things, and they always go, Ooh, but what about guns? I have some news for you. Guns were around from about the mid-1300s, and close combat weapons were used even in the military all the way up until about First World War, very popularly, which shows a very long span of time when guns were around and other close combat weapons. The main problem that comes up is the fact that we have automatic firearms. Now again, if you're in the within that sort of distance, then even if you've got the ability to shoot about nine times in the space of one sword swing or something, then it doesn't matter if you're so close that you can hit, you know, you can cut or thrust or grapple around with someone or do whatever before they have time to react and actually draw or at least deploy their weapon. Uh, besides that, there are ways in which you could perhaps exploit the ability to go into close combat without having to just suddenly come up to someone. You can, for example, use cover. It stands to reason that, you know, if, you, if you're around in an indoor environment and you can be around the corner of a wall, for example, even if the person with the firearm knows that you're there, you're still not able to be shot unless it's an exceptionally powerful firearm that can go through walls, which would be something like, a, I don't know, maybe a .50 caliber sniper rifle or something, in which case you shouldn't be indoors with them anyway. <laughs> you should be shooting them from over there in the horizon. But um, even going back to sort of sneaking up on people or at least getting there before they can react, there are many instances in more sort of guerrilla warfare, you know, where people are underarmed against people who've got very good quality firearms and good training. They're able to sort of hide in the bushes or behind debris in an area and other places like that and then suddenly sneak up on someone. And in that kind of instance, actually, it's preferable to use close combat weapons because if you can quietly crush someone's skull or stab them in the face or something that will kill them pretty quickly, before they have time to sort of yell for help. That's better than getting a very noisy firearm that, let's remember, uses literally explosive force to propel that bullet 
You don't want to be sneaking up and uh, you know, being really quiet and then, oh, here we are, here we are. BANG! Because that's going to give you away. Whereas if you have a little knife and you're just going, oh dear. Yeah. It can be a bit quieter. So that's at least even, you know, without stretching the idea too far, it's a very reasonable situation where something like a knife or a sword or a spear would be useful. But even beyond that, if, if we're talking about an open battle, uh, there is one thing that I think will eventually, well, or at least could eventually, bring close combat back into play. And it's one of the key problems in history that people sometimes, they often forget, especially when you look at things like uh, video games or television and things. It's, it's all just kind of the first shot or stab or something just sort of kills someone. It doesn't matter what they're wearing or what they're doing. But a very important factor with any kind of personal weapon is armour. I've already done a video about uh, this uh, motocross jacket and the modification I did to it. But the point still stands. You have got... Let's put this down. The point still stands that if enough development was done, you could you know, get armour that would prevent a lot of firearms from being as effective. Because, I mean, again, if we go back to medieval times, you know, there were lots of projectile weapons, so really, if you just had a man who's a bit like me, just wearing clothes, but has a close combat weapon, then really you could start going, oh, well, what about bows? What about crossbows? Javelins? Slings? All of those kinds of things. The whole reason why people were able to get up into close combat was either, like I mentioned, guerrilla warfare tactics, being able to sneak up on people and ambush them, or using armour. And actually, it's, you know, you look at things like the Battle of Agincourt, a lot of the knights were captured rather than killed, even though the people with bows won the battle. And if it could get to the point where, with the experimentations I've heard around things like trying to use spider silks, and other such things, and find a way to properly farm them. I heard they tried the idea of genetically modifying goats where their milk has the proteins which are equivalent to spider silks and can be used to create things like medical stuff, but also ballistic armour. Now, be realistic, because it's not like it's impossible. We're at, well, at the moment it stands that you've got two ends of the spectrum when it comes to armour, You've either got things like your standard ballistic armour, which usually covers things like the, the torso and around the head, you know, for your helmet and the sort of chest plate. And it resists usually things like uh, pistols and other smaller calibre firearms, but once you look at things like, let's say, 7.62 calibre, uh, you know, assault rifles and sniper rifles and things like that, it becomes a problem in the fact that they end up quite powerful and can often penetrate through the armour. And the big problem is, you've got those versions, the lighter ballistic armour that's fairly lightweight and you can use it on a battlefield and it's great. But on the other end, you've got things like bomb jackets, you know, bomb suits, whatever they're called. And, of course, as you know, they're there to resist against, guess what, bombs while people are defusing it. But they're just sort of moving around quite clumsily, you know, they're able to articulate their fingers and do some complex tasks, but in terms of actually running around, dodging, you know, hitting and defending, doing all kinds of things in close combat or projectile combat and moving around rapidly, it's a problem. So if you could combine like a Hovis loaf, a best of both, we could have the really good protection of that sort of heavier armour, but the mobility and light weight of those lighter armours, you could get something really good. And with the right sort of ballistic material, you know, like experimenting with things like titanium, spider silk, ceramic plates, other sorts of technologies, you could get to the point where you could have people with full body armour that's also practical to use on a battlefield. So it would be resistance to a lot of projectiles. And yes, you'd still have people able to deploy their, you know, their rifles and things, and well, it would probably be a bit similar to what you get in the medieval period, in that there'd be a lot of shots being made and perhaps hitting the torso, on the outside of the arms, on the top of the skull, bits like that. 
would be prevented in normal shots. But sometimes you might be able to get something like perhaps inside some sort of visor that's not as well protected, maybe in an area that needs to be free and articulating, you know, like the neck so you can talk and breathe and those sorts of human features. You know, being shot in there would obviously kill you still because you're shooting an area that's not covered by the armour. And maybe if you've got things like ceramic plates that need solid, non-flexible protection, then that means areas like under the armpits, uh, inside the elbows, and those sorts of things we look at in medieval armoured fighting would be unprotected, so people still get shot. Excuse me, and we still have a realistic situation where people use guns of perhaps the same calibre because they're sh taking sh you know, pot shots and trying to get into the gaps in armour repeatedly. But at the same time, because most of their body is protected around their torso, their limbs, their head, their legs, all of those areas which currently don't get very good protection, you'd be able to use something like a sword or a spear or something like that. And it'd be realistic to go up into close combat as well because you've got techniques like the old half-swording, grappling, uh, you know, your Krav Maga style throws, disarms, takedowns and things where you could go up to someone, close the distance because your armour prevents you from getting shot in the meantime, and then once you've closed the distance, you could perhaps have superior training in un unarmed and close combat, as well as a weapon suitable for the job, and then start to kind of stab into the gaps more easily, uh, throw a person to the ground and capture them rather than kill them, another situation where you might not want to use guns. And it just overall would be quite useful. And besides that, of course, they, the person who, well, the people who made a wish for this video today also wanted to talk about more fantasial scenarios, and I'm certainly obliged. Now, when it comes to things like your uh, Jedi lightsabers and things, I mean, obviously their lasers are more slow travelling, so you can kind of go, Duh, deflect and do all those kinds of things, but mm, you've still got a narrow pole. And if you've ever tried the archery game called Splitting the Wand, where you have sort of a, a stave in the floor, and you're trying to shoot it, even from pretty close, a number of times the arrows will go a bit past, rather than hitting into it and splitting it, you should know that probably going like this is not a good defence against even a laser shot, never mind a gunshot. So I wouldn't recommend it, unless you can use something like the force and just create some sort of barrier and go, nope, that would be perhaps more, I was going to say realistic, more feasible in universe, let's say, let's we'll stick to that, you know, sort of energy stuff that, or force stuff that covers a larger area and has a bit more margin for error rather than a stick of either it will reflect the laser back at them or oopsie, oh sorry, Story's over, Luke Skywalker's just got shot. Bye-bye. I, I don't think it's very good to try and use a sword against any kind of projectile weapon. It's, it's not a good idea. But um, if we look into things like your sort of post-apocalyptic, you know, sort of nuclear or zombie type of scenario, then you actually end up with a pretty interesting situation. Which is that I've always noticed that when it comes to firearms, in the United Kingdom, most of the time we're talking about people like farmers and people who are defending their lands with shotguns. So of course they've got a couple of shots before they have to reload, or maybe I think the legal limit is up to about three, including the round in the chamber, or otherwise it counts as an assault firearm, such as, you know, your military grade shotgun having maybe eight shells. So you'd have maybe up to about three shots before you have to reload. So that means you've got to, you just need to worry about those before the person has to reload. And then you've got a free opportunity to just grab a sharp thing or a heavy thing and go wild at them. But it's very interesting to note that also most of these people wouldn't have slugs for deer hunting or buckshot, again, you know, for that sort of hunting. Usually, because the typical targets are pests like foxes or things like waterfowl, almost always the ammunition used is birdshot. Now, I've, I remember seeing on this crime sort of documentary about a person who, you know, about a psychotic killer going around trying to kill people and one survivor 
who had been shot, but um, they put their arms in their way or had done something and it got to a point where their arm needed amputating. So of course, being shot even with birdshot can be very dangerous or even lethal because it's still going to do a lot of harm. But compared to things like buckshot and slugs, it's not going to have as much penetrative power. I think, you know, it didn't, it, the, the shot didn't go through the person, it sort of embedded into the person and buried itself in the skin. And of course, there was just too much to remove before it would get infected and spread throughout the body. But that makes me think, if you could have something that's got some resistance, some sort of lighter armour, you probably could take something like a shotgun shot without dying. And another thing you could do, I mean, I've got a buckler here. Let's have it this way up, more comfortable. Um, so here I've got a shield. And, of course, I mean, I'll, I won't be able to see the camera for a second, but if I did something like this, or even something like this, so I can just look over the top, you can see, from your perspective, looking now through your screen, there's the fact that this shield is right now covering my arm, except if I do this, my head if I raise it up high enough, and, you know, basically my entire torso. So if you had something like this, this is something like 14 or 12 gauge, it's too heavy for a buckler really, but even a thinner sort of steel buckler, something, or a shield that's made of sturdy wood, or perhaps some body armour, that's got some resistance, even if it's not in the military grade sense, bulletproof, that could be enough where I could say, you know, the person's pointing a shotgun at me, and I just say, no, put the shield in the way, they shoot, probably thinking, you know, Guns versus medieval stuff, the guns are going to win. They shoot into the shield and waste their shots onto something that's resilient enough, maybe not to resist rifle rounds or shotgun slugs, but can resist birdshot very effectively, whether it is a long-barreled pump-action shotgun, a double-barreled shotgun, or some sort of sawn-off shotgun. Using that type of ammunition, almost universally, as far as I can tell, it would resist it which is great, because once that's happened, I can then cover and either, well, do what I would not recommend and just stand there and take all the shots, or more realistically, use it to cover you while you close the distance. You don't have to go all crazy barbarian where people kind of go like that, ugh, pull their shields away like on TV and have their arms above their head. Ah. Instead, you have the shield in front of you, and you don't have your armour, you just keep it, you can keep it tucked behind the shield because you can still sort of do uh, snappy cuts and things and obviously stab. And you can do all of that from behind the shield. And there is much less of a target available to be shot. And perhaps if you look at things like uh, 0.22 and 0.32 calibre, you know, small rifle and pistol ammunition, that sort of thing could be resisted by something like a buckler or, you know, a broad shield as well. So that's a, that, those are realistic situations where firearms could be defeated by close combat weapons like swords and maces and the like. That's my thought anyway. So I've rambled on enough, I shall leave you to continue commenting about what you think about the idea, and I'll do that thing where I see who's watched all the way through, instead of what I've done before with commenting 57. I shall give you a bit of a, a sort of an analogy to what life is like, and you can just, just comment your reactions to this. So here was something I came up with at work a month or so ago, and it, is, it goes as thus. Life is like eating pillows. At first you think it would be a comfortable experience, but then you realise just how much of an ordeal it would be. And on that crazy note, Thank you for your time, and goodbye.